this anthology here that I want to read you a little passage out of. It's about becoming who we are or who you are because we're all different and we all take different paths to get where we want to be if we led the idealistic life. You know, unlike a lot of self-help books, people, this guy actually is um, not only well, extremely well read, but he's psychologically very acute in his observations. And I personally found a lot of useful, personal, insightful information, so I'd like to share some with you right now by reading a little passage out of his book. This passage is called On the Three Metamorphoses. Are, he pushes all of his ideas to their extreme. So when he's purporting to help you become who you are, um, A, he's doing it selfishly. He's elaborating on his own um, found path towards that aim. And B, he's doing it radically and not haphazardly or half-assly. He's, um, he's trying to become the greatest person he can be given our one life. So he's not justifying mediocrity here. Just to give you guys an idea of um, what you're getting into. But nonetheless, it's uplifting and encouraging, I think. Of the three metamorphoses of the spirit, I tell you. How the spirit becomes a camel, and the camel a lion, and the lion finally a child. There is much that is difficult for the spirit, strong, reverent spirit, that would bear much, but the difficult and the most difficult are what its strength demands. What is difficult, asks the spirit that would bear much and kneels down like a camel wanting to be well loaded. What is most difficult, O oh heroes, asks the spirit that would bear much that I may take it upon myself and exult in my strength. Is it not humbling oneself to wound one's haughtiness, letting one's folly shine to mock one's wisdom? Or is it this, parting from our cause when it triumphs, climbing high mountains to tempt the tempter? Or is it this, being sick and sending home the comforters and making friends with the deaf who never hear what you want? Or is it this, stepping into filthy waters when they are the waters of truth and not repulsing frogs, cold frogs, and hot toads? Or is it this, loving those who despise us in offering a hand to the ghost that would frighten us. All of these most difficult things the spirit that would bear much takes upon itself, like the camel that burdened speeds into the desert. 
thus the spirit speeds into the desert. The loneliest desert, however, a second metamorphosis occurs in. Here the spirit becomes a lion who would conquer his freedom and be master in his own desert. Here he seeks out his last master. He wants to fight him and his last god. The ultimate victory he wants to fight with the great dragon. Who is the great dragon whom the spirit will no longer call Lord and God? Thou shalt is the name of the great dragon. But the spirit of the lion says, I will. Thou shalt lies in his way, sparkling like gold, an animal covered with scales, and on every scale shines a golden thou shalt. Values thousands of years old, shine on these scales, and thus speaks the mightiest of all dragons, quote, all value of all things shines on me, all value has long been created, and I am all created value, verily there shall be no more, there shall be no more I will, thus speaks the dragon, why is there a need in the spirit for the lion? Why is not the beast of burden which renounces his and is reverent enough to create new values that even, that even the lion cannot do but the creation of freedom for oneself, for new creation? That is within the power of the lion creation of freedom for oneself and a sacred no even to duty for that my brothers the lion is needed to assume the right to new values that is the most terrifying assumption for a reverent spirit that would bear much verily to him it is a praying a matter for a beast of prey. He once loved thou shalt as most sacred. Now he must find illusion and caprice even in the most sacred that freedom from his love may become his prey. The lion is needed for such prey. But say, my brothers, what can the child do that even the lion could not. Why must praying, why must the praying lion still become a child? The child is innocence, forgetting, a new beginning, a game, a self-propelled wheel of first movement, a sacred yes. For the game of creation, my brothers, a sacred yes is needed. Spirit now calls, Spirit now wills his own will, and he who had been lost to the world now conquers his own world. Of the three metamorphoses of the Spirit, I have told you how the Spirit became a camel, and the camel a lion, and the lion finally a child. So, what does that even mean? Let's see. After the camel passage, Nietzsche goes on to list several items that may be considered among the most difficult. So, we essentially 
to grow, we must bear extreme burdens. We must ask ourselves what is most difficult and try to do that, to push ourselves well past our own boundaries and um, thereby create new strengths and um, surpass our old ones and um, form ourselves, become more hardened, become more able in both body and in our minds. Um, we all know how how many times um, our own pre our own assumptions about our abilities prevent us from doing something that we actually were capable of all along. So that's of course rings true to me. So the camel must invite these burdens willingly which is so it's why this guy isn't just thought of as a charlatan this Nietzsche character here because his ideas are are absolutely um, modern psycho Psych psychology is absolutely permeated with his ideas such as willfully and that's a very important point is not against your will but according um, using your own um, your own desire to act on your own terms confronting your fears essentially um, as he said um Shaking the hand of the ghost that's, that frightens you. What Nietzsche is saying is that before one can become Overman, which is his famous, um, the Overman being his highest ideal, his Napoleon, Caesar, but even beyond them, people he holds in high regard, Goethe, um, essentially his ideal, his, his Jesus, really, um, one must battle with fear, love, truth, death, confusion, thirst for knowledge, and all the other aspects of human existence. And the camel embraces these challenges in the name of duty and nobility. Put another way, the camel does not run from life or distract itself, which is two major things that I'm very guilty of doing. Distract yourself in uh, by taking longer than you should or being absorbed in something which is okay but lacking time management to know when to put it down or maybe when to pick it up. It greets, the camel greets life head on and embraces the difficulties that it presents out of a sense of duty. In doing so the camel is humbled and strengthened. As he said, I suppose I should have marked it. Clearly, I wasn't prepared. Um, is it not? oneself to wounds, one haughtiness, or one's arrogance, letting one's folly shine to mock one's wisdom. In his quote, one of the biggest errors is not having the courage for one's of one's convictions, but in fact, I quote this on my Instagram, a fact of, uh, to just show how humble I am. A fact. The, the correct way to do it is to have a... The wisest way is to have an attack on one's convictions. Because then uh, you're surely much less probable to uh, be deluded in th into your own grandiosity. So, um, 
that way you definitely won't be much less likely to uh, be confident when in reality you're wrong or you don't have the right to be. Only through suffering these challenges does the camel gain the strength and resilience necessary to attain the next spiritual metamorphoses, which of course is now the lion. And uh, Nietzsche chose the lion because uh, as much as the Nazis used his work to interpret the lion, the figure, this powerful beast with a huge, um, what's the word? I don't know, a, uh, just a magnificent blonde mane. He, uh, he often uses the phrase blonde beast, but it's found that he actually often more meant a lion than actual, just the power and the, you know, the stealthiness, the cunning, so to speak, of that represents the, the lion, and uh, instead of actually talking about the Aryan, you know, I won't even mention that, but, um, he, he uses the imagery of the lion as an example of power, and perhaps the, um, the emergence of our new self after we've taken on these burdens and transformed our psyche and become like if you've ever done something really, really difficult and you've taken it on willingly or maybe at some point throughout the process you you just commit to it and so it's at least at some point willingly once you complete that especially if it's successfully but depends on how difficult the task was relative to um, your perception of it you you come out of it not the same person you come out of it more confident shoulders back you uh, you're a little more maybe proud and arrogant would be the, would be the negative aspects that have grown in you but more positive aspects would be your confidence, your, um, perhaps your more, um, your ability to predict your own, your own abilities, you know, to have a more truthful and honest understanding of who you are and what you're capable of. And, um, and also to have more confidence to be able to stick your neck out and really push the limits of your abilities more. Because that's, I find a very true psychological insight is that the less you try and the more you fail, of course, it seems like common sense, which is, um, so, I, it's an issue I have with people who say that Jordan Peterson's book and his advice is just common sense and therefore it's not really um, of any value but I think the most things the most true things are they seem commonsensical because of the very reason that they are in accordance with our personal experience and what could be more true than things that agree with your personal experience maybe you just didn't know how to articulate them so I think a little bit of respect is in order there but nonetheless it is useful for me to remember that the more as Einstein says, you just get on your bike and keep pedaling forward so as to not fall over. The more you're going to be pushing your limits. 
and the less likely you are to be afraid to push those limits because the only way you grow as a person is in fact to carry a burden, to push yourself, and then by consequence, you um, become, you exit the other side of that, that um, endeavor that little mini adventure, that journey, a new person, a, again, hopefully a, uh, more, more of a human being, not less, but more, you know, you were all the things you were, you're now all the things you were before, plus some, so, yeah, it's no doubt that, that's, um, useful philosophy to go through life, but Nietzsche goes on to describe how the camel ultimately enters the loneliest desert before becoming a lion. The only de the lonely desert metaphor can be interpreted as the camel having sought out and invited the struggles that life has to offer. society that has produced it, it finds itself questioning everything, both its own worth and the value of its society, um, or the value of its pursuits that it had hitherto held as worthy of attaining, but the concept of differentiating your oneself from your origins is part of what this is talking about. You know, we need the society, we need our, our family, our friends, our community, our nation, um, our species, and the history, the deep history involved in that too give us an initial sense of identity and something to really hold on to, but you don't truly grow as a person and, and become an individual until you take on burdens and responsibilities, test your limits, increase your strengths, um, and refine your skills. At which point you can turn around as a competent, more competent figure and perhaps intellectually or, or um, any other way, question the very pursuits that you've been told to question. And uh, I honestly didn't intend it, but this is... I'm referencing Jordan Peterson quite a bit, I actually. It's just that it's so in line because he was so influenced by Nietzsche and his idea of the order of society being the masculine father of patriarch and the, the uh, unhindered anarchic chaos of mother nature, they're yin and yang, you know, they're not, one is not better than the other, one is not worse than the other, they're equal, equally powerful ideas that are mutually needed to balance each other out, and the idea of a stagnant state, his idea of saving your father from the belly of the whale like Jonah or Pinocchio is grounded in the fact that the state is a very thing that defines where nature begins. Everything outside of that is chaos in nature and we are needed to update the state and it's a very crucial concept. 
the fact that we rely on the state to develop and form us, but it's up to us to, once we've reached a form, formative period and we've assimilated all the, uh, the best qualities of the state that we can, then it's up to us to go out gather information for ourselves to individualize us and bring that information back to update the state so that the state can be as in accordance with reality as it can be because the um, you know I think his idea was that the Nazis were the extreme of a non-updated state. So many people were scared to question the state that they were grown up in, that the state just ran away on a incredibly negative feed, tyrannical feedback loop. And it was blind. It was overly orderly. It had a clear set of defined values that it did not want broken. So... this idea of the lion is that one becomes so strong that you you relied on the state to grow and develop yourself but now you are a true individual and you need to you're at this point you are competent competent enough because you've pushed your limits enough to um to essentially not define your own values, not create your own values, but be able to discern, excuse me, be able to actually distinguish, discern your own values, the values you, um, out of the values that you were told to value and hold in high esteem as a young youth. You can now choose which ones ring more true to you based on your uh, plethora of experience. The desert can be seen as a place of existential crisis. such universal virtues and absolute purpose do not exist and the camel is forced to confront the possibility and thus the camel becomes a lion um, and so while Nietzsche was thought to believe that uh, such universal virtues and you know absolute purposes don't exist. That's where Jordan Peterson differs, and Carl Jung um, very much so elaborated on Nietzsche's ideas, because they both, as far as I understand, they both thought that Nietzsche, because he died when he was really young, in his fifties. And they thought that um, he didn't didn't get a chance to develop and mature a lot of his profound and genius ideas. But um, I think it's important, you know, that Peterson is so hell bent on religion being encapsulating important truths essentially because of its ability to endure. So he thinks that uh, it tells you how to act and perhaps religion is the most ancient state, state organized structure, cultural structure that uh, 
we must continually update. So it's a fine line between the sacredness of religion and its core ideas and the ability of people who, of course, um, comp confident, confident, but competent enough to be able to, yeah, that's really it, you just have to be competent enough and have had enough experience to be able to update something as profound and, um, embedded, deeply embedded in our thought and in actions as religion. So, um, I think that just the ultimate message Nietzsche is trying to get across is that there's so much room for us to grow and so many of us don't and so many of us don't pursue it to its ultimate ends and he thinks that if we did stay persistent and didn't just reach a plateau and get comfortable and etc if we did honestly keep pursuing our goals and our self-development then uh, who knows really how amazing a life the experience of life could really be and uh, to me that's that's in line with thinking about how brave and courageous and intelligent and thoughtful and creative our ancestors must have been 200, 150, 10,000 years ago and also extrapolating out into the future what you know where where are we going to take that trajectory and it's up to us it literally is each one of us every day um yeah I think I was watching Blood Diamond the other night and I wish I remembered the exact quote but you know of course I'm perceiving everything through the lens of what I'm currently reading the philosophy I'm currently learning but it did ring true and it did align with it in a quite a few spots of that movie but the the reporter lady who's out there trying to um you know prevent the mass genocide of these african people which are which is fueled by the um the the profits created by these blood diamonds anyways her, her point was that you know was that when our when, when we get daunted by the fact that there's these huge looming um waves of of events and phenomena in the world and they seem to be overall um, negative you know there's there's so many bad things that happen every day there's also so many good things that, that happen every day there's so many people out there doing good things so I don't know I, I butchered that one so this actually is not the quote I was talking about but it's one of them that I was referring to and is that uh, Leo Leo DiCaprio in the movie says so you think because your intentions are good and they'll spare you huh and the uh, the, the, the village teacher who was a good intention guy said my heart always told me that people are inherently good my experience suggests otherwise but what about you, Mr. Archer, in your long career as a journalist? He was posing as a journalist. Would you say people are mostly good? He says, no, they're just people. They're just people. And the teacher says, exactly. It's what they do that makes them good or bad. A moment of love, even in a bad man, can give meaning to a life. None of us knows whose path will lead us to God. I don't know, maybe that's profound, maybe not, but... I... You know, I like... 
like to think of it as there, it's, you know, is anything really ever as black and white, low resolution as all that? You know, people do negative things all the time, but uh, at the same time, the ocean of of culture and the waves of historic events aren't they all but just a series of droplets of individual actions every day and they just somehow in a weird way form swells and ocean currents in tides that ebb and flow so back to Back to the camel's transition into a lion. When the camel discovers that universal truth and virtue may not exist, it has two choices. It can reject life as meaningless and probably commit suicide or something, or it can claim its own freedom and create its own meaning, which is uh, the overman. Camel must obviously do the latter. Do you descend in the hell and chaos, or do you ascend into uh, your ideal, which you could call Buddha, God, Jesus? To do this, the camel must destroy the largest barrier to truth. True and true, true freedom. The duty and virtue imposed by tradition and society. This is what Nietzsche's great dragon represents. The camel had been a slave to the dragon, inviting life's challenges, but always living in accordance with the values imposed upon it from without. The dragon of thou shalt can also be seen simply as representing everyone who would try to tell someone else how to live their life. The camel must reject this dragon of tradition and commands and um, but it cannot but it cannot in its current duty loving form. Thus it must become a lion. Its trials have allowed it to attain enough strength to become a lion. You can't just do a couple push-ups and be a lion, or just ask one girl out. You gotta, you have to live a boundary-pushing life, and just by definition, that is what will create a lion. The lion symbolizes courage, tenacity, disillusionment, or even rage. Um, unbridled passion. Only in this state is the spirit able to deliver the sacred, the no. And uh, the sacred no represents the utter rejection of external control and traditional values. Everything imposed by other individuals, society, churches, governments, families, and all forms of propaganda must be denied in an empowered roar and that's uh, that's an important part you can say no but is it going to look like you mean it to the other person and that's the real key to um, knowing I guess you're the lion is uh, your conviction in certain things, so you uh, you want to have the courage of your convictions, but the true overman would be able to have the courage of convictions based on its really deep internal experience, yet be open enough, be walking that line of yin and yang carefully enough between chaos and order that he would be open-minded to be able to recognize when he's wrong. So, 
third and final metamorphosis is is I think the refreshing concept of becoming a child because most I feel like most less lesser stories or, or philosophers It's very insightful to know that a true human being um, at its uppermost limits isn't just a powerful, uh, courageous, aligned with convictions, but it's one who has the open-mindedness, the awe, the uh, joy of life that would um, be represented by a child. So after this, Lion delivers its sacred no. Sacred because it's the most meaningful to him to deliver it. It's an unavoidable path to self-creation and manifestation and meaning and overcoming oneself, which is another famous reoccurring theme in Nietzsche's work. After this line has delivered the sacred no, the spirit still must make one more transformation to become the overman that's becoming a child. So what can a child do that even the lion could not do? Why must the praying lion still become a child? This child is innocence and forgetting. A new beginning, a game, a self-propelled wheel first movement, a sacred yes to life. For the game of creation, my brothers, a sacred yes is needed. The spirit now wills his own will, and he who had been lost to the world now conquers his own world. So Nietzsche holds that the lion must again transform in order to forget Spirit has undergone much duress and turmoil in its transformations, and uh, but it must cleanse its mind of the past. Through the sacred yes, the child affirms the moment, affirms uncertainty, affirms the flux of life. The child becomes a self-propelled wheel, just as life can be viewed in the same terms child elects to roll with life, to dance, to play with it. Ultimately, for Nietzsche, the pure creation arises from this state of play. When one can achieve a child mind, a mind immersed in the moment, filled with wonder and playfulness, then one can will his own will, create his own virtue, and thus create his own reality. In undergoing this final metamorphosis, the spirit overcomes itself, conquers the world, and reaches the state of liberation, the overman. So, in understanding the overman real quick, the important thing to note is that Nietzsche was, like most philosophers, a voracious truth seeker. The objection the objection of uh, positing that there are no universally good values and we can create our own values, which of course could lead to a very chaotic, anarchic road. Um,
is a, a utilitarian or consequentialist reading of Nietzsche, which is, you know, the greatest good, the greatest common good, um, which I'm no philosopher, I'm no, even, I've taken one little introductory course in college, so I don't understand any of the deep psychological underpinnings, um, psychological, that's funny, weird slip, logical underpinnings of the great philosophic schools of thought, but I think I know enough now to reject the utilitarian view, which is the greatest good for the most people, because the, at least, you know, my mind, maybe you have a good argument for it, is that it one of its ultimate conclusions could be that the greatest good would be for us all to be equal and mediocre. Equal in our mediocrity. And I don't think that's a life worth living. So, for Nietzsche, this objection would have been yet another example of mankind attempting to impose arbitrary moral standards onto a universe in which none objectively exist. He was less interested in the imaginary moral constructs of mankind than discovering the actual truth of existence. Yeah, um... So... Yeah, people might think that he was, a, you know, a, a cold, a cold um, academic intellect with his theories of overcoming and, and overcoming yourself and um, praising at points dominations of other people who are less powerful than you. Um, that's, of course, grossly oversimplifying his argument, but... You put that in the context of one of his last known actions as an actual human being in the world was to go insane as he's trying to uh, save a horse from being beaten in the last decade of his life. Which, of course, tells us that he had a lot of compassion. A lot of compassion. So, so the uh, person I'm reading here says, It's possible to see Nietzsche's child, a playful being in touch with its own deep down nature, as uncannily similar to a realized Taoist or Zen Buddhist. There's a Zen saying that, uh, quote, Nothing is left to you at this moment, maybe a nirvana, but to have a good laugh is uh, meant to refer to the moment after one has attained satori or enlightenment yeah very interesting the, the connection right there so for the overman essentially to wrap it up pain is necessary for positive transformation and should be embraced. It's true for me. I haven't experienced enough pain. I know that. In order to liberate ourselves, we must wage war against troll by an external authority. Um, it's true just that steel sharpens steel. And when you have a good argument, even if someone wins, it makes you look like a fool. If you're humble enough to be able to recognize that, then maybe you could get rid of that dead bark, burn it off. That was clearly not working for you. And make room for uh, a new a new perspective. Or maybe you just need that. You had an incomplete set of ideas and you need to re-fortify them. Um, yeah, it's continual growth. A 
We must cultivate great courage, strength, and audacity in order to truly sever our puppet strings. And lastly, our goal should be to affirm life and dance with it, to play. Positive feedback and construct.